Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Speak. We cannot wait to get into this. This is an Elisa topic, and we're going to be covering or talking about curriculum. So, Elisa, why don't you fill us in on what's on your mind and why you want to talk about curriculum or curriculums? Um, why I want to talk about curriculums. Why did I want to talk about curriculums? <laughs> I fucking remember, mate. It was ages ago. <laughs> I picked the topic and I was like, I'm going to do so much research. I'm going to be so good. And um, and then I just continued living my life and I didn't do any research. But I look, I have thoughts and I have opinions. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and also I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to say for people watching, um, if you are watching on YouTube, if you see me like starting to, to look a bit fucking frantic, there is a fly. This is my fly swat. Welcome to, we said live, real, unedited, uh, and authentic, fly. right? <laughs> this fucking fly, and I, like, he literally, it's the same fucker every week. <laughs> He's waiting in here till we record. He is really it's interested like, I, in what you love or hate about curriculum. That's what's happened. He's been like, I know this topic. I've heard her go off on one about several things to do with curriculum. Oh, and I'm he just here for the show. Yeah. Well, anyway, so there'll be a lot of this. Um, I don't know if, if you've ever watched, have you watched Breaking Bad? No. There is this phenomenal episode where Walter White is, you know, down in his lab cooking up his fucking, oh, I got him. Oh my God, I got him. Celebration. <laughs> oh, there's fly guts on my computer screen. Sick. Um, anyway, anyway, he's, he spends the whole episode like running around his lab trying to catch this fly. It's, look, I identify with it. Anyway, okay. <laughs> back the fly's dead i can now concentrate on curriculum and if you stay with us that long thank you very much for all your patience and participation <laughs> right go for it. thoughts feelings why are we talking about it thoughts and feelings um i suppose this kind of conversation could lead us into the whole qualifications versus experience all that kind of thing which um is probably a conversation that has been had so many times uh, but never by the two of us yeah and it's re it's a relevant conversation um but having recently completed a level eight safety qualification here in ireland which is probably the equivalent to i think level six with you guys right um I was really disappointed with the level of, with the quality of the curriculum, I guess. The quality of the content, um, I just expected a lot more from it. Um, now, maybe that's because I've been working in safety roles for so long before going into this kind of a qualification. I'd done, you know, shorter courses and things like that before. Mm. But I guess it's just... I don't know who sets the curriculums, who decides and, and can I have a fucking word please? Because, <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you know, I just, there's gaps and it's just. Yeah. I think re really interestingly from an observer's perspective, seeing this, seeing you go through the last parts of that qualification, how much it owned of your time, mm -hmm. the headspace, but also that you were that you had to really fight the annoyance around the quality while trying to rededicate and give up so much at the same time. So I can yeah. imagine it being quite frustrating. And yeah, that sense of disappointment of I'm giving everything, but I feel like whoever's setting this hasn't given it their all because so what was missing? Was it challenge? Was it just the quality of the work? What what was missing? Um there was definitely like there was um challenge in some of the modules but some of the modules were um really dated like really dated um and i guess in this particular course there was so much crossover like every single lecturer was like so this is a hazard and this is a risk i was like oh sweet jesus like it was really basic really basic when like it's meant to be for people it was for mature students, so you're meant to be already out in the workforce, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it just it was pitched 
at a really basic level when it's definitely being sold and marketed as a much higher quality pro- uh, product, I guess. Um, and definitely in Ireland, it would be, oh, I have a level eight from UCC. Right. Like, with a fucking marble in my mouth. And like, I would have had a lot of people go on, brag about that, having this qualification. And I thought it was the be all and end all. And then I went and did it and I was like, oh, wow. Okay. This is not great. And so then, then I'm concerned about the competency of people coming out of this course. Yeah. Because to be honest, (laughs) they've got the equivalent of a master's degree. Well, well, yeah. Um, and like, I think, yeah, the next level up is masters and it's like some of the lecturers even look, I'm not going to lie to you, Crystal. I'm a difficult student, okay? No, I won't <laughs> have it. It was literally, and because it was um, during COVID and it was like, oh, at least it's coming off mute again. I'm like, I have things to say about. This. I have some thoughts. <laughs> I have some thoughts about these lecturers who happen to be also safety consultants who are then sprouting their own shit. Mm. Like, yeah, which I'm like, hey, ethics, where is. Yeah. Which even actually ethics wasn't even a module. There was nothing about ethics in the whole. Oh, well. Sorry. I oh, think... I tell a lie. There was one lecturer who was phenomenal. Um, and she had lect- she had ethics and things in hers, but she was the only person who quoted any safety science. They all had, they all had Heinrich, Heinrich's triangle, all of that jazz. Yeah. But that's literally where it stopped. I think one of them had James Reason as well, but that was it. She was the only one who had anything up to date. Jesus. Um, it was really disappointing. And and I don't, yeah, I don't know who sets the curriculum. I think it's it's interesting actually that um this could go off in a million different ways. You've already said about competency versus experience, which I think is so interesting. Um, because I think at the end, but I'm totally biased, I think, but I have worked alongside people that came straight from uni and went into the workplace. I am somebody that definitely worked their way through and, and did the qualifications as they went. And at the end of a 10 year journey, you can either have a qualification and five years experience, or you can have 10 years. And yeah. I, I much prefer to have, and I also found the qualifications easier. So I did the equivalent, the, the level six, um, the level six NIWOSH diploma. Um, and I found whenever I apply myself, so I did in, I think, 18, 24 months, I did about three of the certificates and the diploma. The mm. ability just to say, I know what that looks like. This is what I would do. I know what that looks like. This is what I would do. Um, it, I thought it made the studying so much easier and allowed me to evolve what I was already doing in the workplace to a more competent standard than to just be, I've, I've studied the book and I have no frame of reference in the workplace whatsoever. So I think I think it's a more powerful frame to have the both um, at the same time. But, you know, all paths in are valid. Yeah. Um, and then I suppose the other part, part that you just you just raised there is about what's missing. What's very obviously missing. And I, I do feel this could be a topic on its own almost because in all of the study that I have done, we talk about, sort of the legislation in depth what you should be doing this is a hazard what's the definition like anyone that comes out of these courses can it's something to, that has the potential to cause harm what's likelihood what's you know what's risk all that you know all these bloody standard phrases but nobody is talking in depth about the reason this stuff exists and you know all the soft skills how do you hold your board to account how do you start a really great conversation how do you have difficult conversations? We work in a field where lots and lots of people are doing stuff that is putting themselves or others at risk. And you're not supposed to start a war when you address that stuff. You're supposed to create a moment of realization for the person that they are worth more than the corner they are cutting. You know, who is it helping? You get the job done quicker, quicker for who? Not for you, right? I want you to go home and nowhere in any of that stuff those courses do you really get into the ethics or the soft skills or any of that stuff and it really is missing mm. I, in getting the professional ready 
Um, yeah. I mean, you could go you could go any any which ways. I mean, disappointing for you to have been a student and just felt a bit let down by it all, and also a bit gritty on the consultant selling wares. I'm your teacher, but also you can buy my time. Ugh. Yeah, it, like there was yeah there was one in particular who was like, oh well, if the HSA, which is like our equivalent of the HSC come into your business and give you a prohibition notice like you, you actually have to get a consultancy in to get that lifted i was like i'm sorry i'm sorry we're in the legislation excuse me and yes. he was like sorry what i was like you just said he goes oh well you know what i mean i was like jesus christ i was like i know what you mean but there are 40 other students here who might actually be writing that down and taking it literally and going back to the business going oh yeah well actually i know i'm your in-house safety advisor but we have to get a consultant in I was like, you can't just be that willy nilly with your words. Yes. Like, stop it. Do better. Yeah, do do better. Jesus, do better. So <laughs> it's really <laughs> irritating. Um, that kind of thing. It just really irritated. And I suppose as well, there was um I suppose again my experience of that particular course, it was during COVID, but it was literally just reading off, it was reading off slides. That was it. Yeah. And I get that it's lecturing, but it's where is the the science of learning and development, which is a whole other science of literally how people learn. And it is not by sitting down and just looking at a slide and hearing someone drone on word for word. Yeah. And it's like because and and I had this conversation with someone. They were like, "Oh yeah, but Lisa, their lectures like that's what they are." I was like, "That's not good enough. Mm. It's not good. Well, first of all, it's not good enough because God, I paid what was it seven and a half grand for this qualification. Um, to be told like tough. This is what it is. Yeah, oh. I think there, I think there is. I can look back through my qualifications and say there has been really good experiences and really bad ones the good ones and I was I will always remember this guys my foot I've been waiting for years to get my Nebosch general certificate um <clears throat> and the reason it was such a big deal is because literally five years before um was working in Domino's and, and was a cleaner and I'd got my first safety job and I'd heard about this quarter and I thought it was like magic I was like oh if I get oh. that that's like the biggest thing that I will ever do and bearing in mind, no background in safety, completely dyslexic. And I was like, this is going to be like the pinnacle of life. <laughs> uh, and I got sent on this course and I'd gone all the way through uh, five years in the nuclear industry. And they wouldn't give it to me because of my background, in inverted commas. Um, <clears throat> and I, I know I got in the rail industry um, and they gave, they gave it to me straight away. And they said, right, of course, we're going to pop you on that. I've got five years experience in safety now. I'll put you on this course. And I still remember my tutor was called Bob um, and he had been retired for ages. I mean, we're talking 20 years ago now. And um, I remember every story he told because he didn't teach us what the book said. He Mm. talked to us about the stories that he'd seen in his career that were about what the book said. So when we were doing the exams at the end, everybody came out so confident because questions had come up and they I don't think anyone got shy of a credit because it was just so interactive um and I later I felt so passionate about this again uh, the nerd in me will come out when I was pregnant with Emily I was like I need to learn how to be a teacher for adults because I can't let what is the dominant safety qualification really in the UK be delivered in any other way other than what Bob is doing and I put mm. numerous people in my teams on um <clears throat> varying certificates and stuff and they come back mixed reviews depending where they were in the country or their tutor and I was like I can't I, I need people to feel so engaged with this and learning about all the different ways like the peer-to-peer learning the mm. you know, the gap analysis in the room if this happens what what's next pick on somebody if they don't know open the room up and let somebody teach the room like just even different voices involved in the lesson is so important um and moments to break out do exercises really play with the information that you're giving them and I totally agree with you it's missing from so many classrooms especially when we're talking about we're more aware now of neurodivergence we're going to stick people with ADHD and dyspraxia and dyslexia and all these people in front of a million screens with a million books it's you know we're going to have to be more inclusive 
Um, so yeah, I find it really interesting that it's just how it's delivered it, and it's just a given, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. just a given. Um, and it's, ugh, yeah, it just gives me the ick, really. It just gives me the ick. Do you know, so my, my most favourite, favourite part of when I did the diploma, which is probably the, the proudest thing I've ever done for me, um, and it was the element, the law element, and because we had to do all the case law that sat under the legislation, and it's the only time I've ever seen it, all the other qualifications that I've done or looked at, and it wasn't just like, you know, the health and safety work out, the welfare regs, all that, it was learning the, and I mean bucket, <laughs> Oh. of uh, um, case law that sat underneath it and we really did learn about the name of people that got hurt how they got hurt how that set a precedent through the judge how that became legislation and how other accidents then pushed that legislation further or it got changed later and I loved and I still bring workplaces back to it now I loved the idea of knowing who got hurt to create that because one's like oh it's just regulation it depends mm. how you approach it. It is, and if you speak about it from a compliance sense, boring, right? Essential, but you're not stimulating growth or culture change with that conversation. The minute you can bring it back to, and I love to throw this out there, how many people do you think had to die before we made a piece of legislation that protected this? And everyone gets all a bit, oh God, like a bit rough. <laughs> Go on, Kristen. <laughs> heavy with all the people loving um but it's the you know do, do you think parliament would change or create a piece of legislation because one person died and they'd be like mm, no so okay how many people and it's just and it just gets the juices flowing enough that they don't know the answer i don't know the answer but the answer is way more than one mm. right lots of this had to happen constantly before somebody somewhere said that's probably enough um, and one is too much, but to create law and legislation to lock something down, something really major has to have consistently gone wrong. And so I loved, um, I absolutely loved learning about the case law and the ethics behind law. That really brought it home to me and made me really care about it in a different way. Um, and like little things like I know the case law behind the Occupies Liability Act, and there's two parts, and that's really rare. And what what happened to make one get built on top of the other one and I just love it it makes me love legislation and when you say that everyone's like oh god compliance geek I'm like no mm -hmm. I'm a story geek like I love that people got hurt and we changed something because they got hurt we made a positive change and I want to make sure I uphold that positive change um so the ethics part of the diploma that I did I really enjoyed and I just find it's any conversation about pain or loss or harm does tend to be missing from quite a lot um, of the stuff. Although it is changing. I mean, there's way more on the market now. There's way more qualifications than there ever. It used to be just dominantly one qualification. You could go and do your master's to top it up if you wanted. But we are seeing competitors now, right? We've got IOSH have their qualifications, Nibosh. Nibosh have gone open book. We've got um, NCRQ. Mm -hmm. like the massively life friendly way of doing and understanding the same sort of you know curriculum as the Nibosh diploma um and yet you're allowed to just do it in your own time do case studies study situations and send them into tutors and stuff so I think there's there's way more on the market than there has been but the bit that's still consistently missing I think is the soft skill part it doesn't matter mm -hmm. where you look, it's missing yeah um, so yeah that's just my thoughts yeah I'm just thinking back there on like all of that qualification that I did um mm. just so that I'm not like I fucking hated every bit of it <laughs> there was <laughs> obviously I got something out of it um but I think it was literally the couple of modules there was a few modules that were delivered by the same person who um was fantastic Marion Coyley is her name but um and she actually did a lecture on the history of um what was it the history of scientific management or management science so like all the way back to Taylorism mm -hmm. 
Um, and so how your man Taylor was like, right, everything needs to be a process. Everything needs to be like, bum, 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 the same and just make people all do this and then everything will work and it'll all be quicker and it'll all be better and da, 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 da. And then, but she kind of took us the whole way through the history of, of how it evolved over the years. And and then there was another, I can't even think of the names now. Well, fair play to me again with my research before the episode. But there was some other guy then who came up with like theory X and theory Y for management, but about employees. So I'll probably get these fucking the wrong way around now. But anyway, let's just say theory X is people are a bit shit. People don't want to work. Uh, people don't want to do anything. So you need to tell them and you need to crack the whip. And that's what managers are for. So managers mm-hmm. hold the smarts and then the people just do the thing and then theory why was theory why was people are intrinsically motivated people want to do well for the sake of doing well and how to basically give people dignity within their work and actually just fucking be sound (laughs) it's really easy then that way to people will work for you really well if you don't treat them like shit um and I'm I'm paraphrasing, guys. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, sure. But that was country, yeah. <laughs> right. So that's back in like the I don't know when Theory X was white. Some time range between the fucking thirties and seventies, sometime in there. Yeah. But like it's amazing that even now we were we were talking about all this, and I go back into work and I can hear people saying these things. You hear it every day, and you're like, this stuff has permeated so deep into the culture of work and into the culture of management and therefore into safety management that it's like fuck this stuff is it's stuck and it's how do we get rid of it um the bad stuff of it i mean but yeah so yeah i found that really interesting and i found it interesting then how to think about i guess the more modern approaches that we have now I like to think that in another 60 or 70 years people will just automatically go oh well I wonder what the context was or oh I wonder why this was difficult for that person or oh let's remember they won't even have to say let's remember there's a person at the center of this because it will be automatic yeah that would be that would be beautiful and I think the uh you I mean you pinging all sorts of light bulbs in my head as you're talking about it but I think the thing that's missing it is so ingrained in business and in safety management because it doesn't, you know, the amount of organizations that I have walked into. And even when you talk about accident, such basics, accident investigation, 101, right? There is a human in the middle of it. Something has happened to someone and there is going to be a million reasons why. And our job is to find out as many of those causes, remove them, mitigate them, whatever that is. But our motivations that should be finding out very clearly what happened, not whose fault it was, what happened. And the question is always, I oh, oh God, drives me bonk, literally is a pet peeve that I see these investigations. So give me the last 50 decent investigations that you have, and you tend to see a couple of things. One, it would just be Jeff did a bad thing. Jeff should have known better. Yes. God, Jeff. Jeff, right? And then what did you do? Corrective action was what well, I told Jeff to rewatch the training that we'd already given him that led to this accident um, <laughs> and uh, Jeff should have known better. And then the next thing you see somebody else having the same accident. It's like Bob, God damn Bob. Right. Or Bob Ina. Let's, let's not be a, let's not be a, let's, let's have some equality going on in the conversation. Bob Ina. Ina right. Um, she did a stupid thing. So we trained us the piece of paper that was already in place that didn't work in the first place. Stupid to Babina, and um, she can just go back and carry on because what we created in the first place was correct. And it really makes me want to cry because I'm like, okay, did anyone look at the quality of the paper that they were retraining from? Did anyone look at how many accidents happen under that process? How many of a similar type? Like what is going wrong for so many people to be getting hurt or even somebody to be getting hurt? The conversation becomes around becomes about fault immediately because of this. People are intrinsically stupid, and it's the bosses that have got the smarts. That is absolutely inaccurate. Flip that on its head, mm. and I always say when you come to innovation, 
you know, the there's a power triangle, right? And you've got power and money at the top, people with the budgets, people with the decision-making power at the top of the triangle. There's a few of those. And then you've got all of your business, all of your people and employees underneath that. Well, guess how many brains there are at the top, even if they're exquisite brains. Like <laughs> 1%, 5% if you're small of your organization sits. You've got the 5% of the brains that are possible sit there. Flip that on its head and all of those brains can come up. They know your processes inside and out. They know how to slick and something up. They cut the corner because your process doesn't work and they can tell you how to make it better immediately. And our job is to find out what's really going wrong from all those people. So we can tell, we're just supposed to be the conduit. We can tell then the people with the budget that we need some so we can change something, but we don't. We just say people are doing the wrong thing and we assume that what we've created is right. And by the way, most of the stuff that we've created was a dude in an office that did the job 20 years ago and he just did it from memory and has filed it on a quality management system. And it's and the review date's been changed. <laughs> just <laughs> but that's but this is what is in curriculums as well. Yeah. Like this is what we're churning out. Yeah. So why like and it's like we keep ex- it's that thing of expecting something different but we keep doing the same yeah I think oh the, I did some research in my last job and I had some help from a really cool guy um I think he's now retired and we made a decision tree and it was about consequence it was trying to take the business uh on a journey about what consequence should look like while really safeguarding the employee and allowing them to be honest in investigation and it was it it basically just said one of the key things in this decision tree was like bad thing happened bob got hurt bobina got hurt um and we asked several questions and one of the questions in the center of the decision tree was if you put somebody of equal competency and equal experience in the position in the same position would they have made the same decision if the answer is yes it is not Bobina's fault, right? You cannot, your Justice own, for Bobina. Justice for Bobina, right? Um, and it was such a powerful, oh yeah, but that's going to be, that's going to be yes in a lot of cases. Brilliant. Okay. Let's you talk can't be busy. about that. <laughs> you're going to be busy because you're going to have got to do your job now. <laughs> you're actually going to have to go and identify, ah, somebody would have done it. Now your next job is to go and talk to all the people that would have made the same decision and get them together and say, now we're, we're understanding we've got something wrong. How can we do this differently? Um, talk to us and tell us because under the decision tree, the only consequence is us changing our process, right? So let's get there. But man, it's, it's a tough old journey. But even that, if we train in investigation, we do like, I don't know what, witness statement taking, how to write another by the way yeah we do some stuff on root cause or the domino theory or you know whatever the swiss cheese model but all all that stuff and and yet no one talks about fair consequence from memory i mean i did my diploma a bloody long time ago but Mm. naturally i am drawn to what fair consequence is and the majority of the time it's something needs to change or it's a coaching opportunity or something very 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 rarely unless it's malicious intent and by the way i believe in absolutely safeguarding employees if you've done something maliciously that could hurt your others that's a different conversation altogether consequence is clear yeah you can't work around the people that are here to do a great day's work and go home um but there's nothing really taking you through ethical consequence but how do we dig into that mm. um and bring that to life so yeah I'd love to see, I'd love to see stuff like fairness decision trees and how to create them for yourself embedded in even just to be able to go and do a course on harm reduction and look at all of that all the sciences people's natural motivations the stuff you were talking about x and y was that in the book that we read for for um, the pm book club on motivation that that book called motivation or was that a different one Oh, I think Daniel Pink's book, was it Drive? Drive, yeah. Didn't read it. Okay. I, I read very few books for that book. <laughs> I read uh, 40 minutes of that one. Um, oh, well then. It might yeah. have been, yeah, it could have been in that one. It's like, it's... Well, they yeah. were it was to do with the... Um, it, but they were basically saying, we we assume people want the money 
that's yeah. the motivator and yet they they go through really really simple uh, examples of clearly it's not about reward sometimes it's just about the right thing and we do treat people like ah we'll give them you know we'll give them a bit of a bit of extra money or a bit of reward and stuff and you know it's not what really motivates people to do something differently in a sustained way mm. um so yeah I, th- I think it's it's really interesting if we were gonna summarize as much as we've just talked through that and it's been enjoyable I think the thing that I would love to see change is a if you're going to put a curriculum out please make sure it's not dated mm-hmm. it's oh god there was literally slides with the 1980 fucking nine act on it I was like burn you fuckers to the ground this is insane <laughs> I'm not having it. Or write a letter. It's actually September. I still haven't written that letter. <laughs> write that letter. So, I mean, up to date, up to date content is a basic. Yeah. I would love, like, I, I have to say, I was really lucky. I enjoyed my qualifications, but I would love to see more ethics stuff, the case law and things that I did in the diploma. I'd love to see more of that out there, just in general courses. Like, tell me mm-hmm. why this, tell me why I should be doing it. Tell me who got hurt so I can relate empathetically and then also relay that empathetically um would love to see that i'd love to see some soft skill stuff like mm. how to hold a room how to influence people how to i don't know the investigation thing is going to bug me for life just some yeah <laughs> but even i think there was um there was actually one book recommended by marion the good lecturer on that course and it was um it was can't remember the exact title, but it was self-reflect the practice of self-reflection for safety professionals. Mm, nice. Never, I had never heard of that book. Um, and it was actually like I didn't read it all. I skimmed it for a, <laughs> an assignment, but there was definitely parts, and I was like, "Oh, that's kind of interesting." Um, but there should be a, a hell of a lot more of of that as well. Um, yeah. Just just learn so much from actually taking a beat and stopping and like kind of I suppose what we spoke about in the whole that content episode about taking everything in we're actually reflecting on it and understanding it and creating our own views on it we just are so quick to go well this is what the management system says so this is what it must be or this is what the rule is so this is what it must be and it's like god you're allowed to have your own opinion yeah And, and so often people go oh that's high risk and I'm like is it though or are you just are you just wrapping people in cotton wool? Like, yeah. what is it? And yeah. and you say something like that, and Jesus Christ, they'd be throwing a crucifix at you. Like, stop. So, yeah. But it's this thing of we need to be more confident in, yeah, critical thinking. Shout out to Simon Casson, our resident philosopher from a uh, Project Millennium. But this thing of critical thinking, yeah, is not a skill that, and that should be in everything. That's not just safety. That should just life but yeah yeah I do like that the the self-reflection piece I think is is really important and the discussion I mean this goes back to what I said about the zero harm fallacy right I don't think that should be embedded in any courses because it's uh, the risk appetite of any organization is down to the organization and it Mm. should group discussion um and it is really really easy to just say high risk high risk high risk and put in every single control known to man but you cannot operate like that. And I think not only do I think the zero harm thing is just not real. And, you know, I said it in that episode, said it in a million forums, but anything that's construction, telecoms, anything that's outside or graft, Mm -hmm. what are you taking away, the human or the weather? Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be harm and you're going to have to be okay with that actually. Um, you know, we train electricians to work in certain circumstances on things like buzz bars, extremely high risk competent, yeah. right? But in really, really particular circumstances, there are experts that can do these. We, we, we blow up buildings in the middle of cities with dynamite and they fall perfectly because we've nailed it. Very, very high risk. Once upon a time, sort of been like, you're going to do what? Yeah. yeah. But we're going to design it properly and we're going to nail it. So, we do some cool shit, man. We do some great stuff. Um, absolutely great stuff. So I think, yeah, we definitely have to get the whole risk adverse 
zero harm stuff i think we just need to start taking that out if that's in any curriculum my, my personal opinion would be if somebody came, if i put a, if i put a newbie on a course and they came back talking to me about zero harm and reducing all risks to nil i'd be like oh god okay you're gonna have, gonna have to unpick all yeah that because we actually got to run a business so yeah i like the critical thinking i like that what do we really think is possible? What do we really think respect is? What do we really think safety is in our organisation? We should be having bigger, wider conversations and not just with your safety professionals, right? Well, like they, they're like the last person you need to talk about. <laughs> 100%, just, to, just have the conversation and maybe have one have somebody to facilitate that, have the diluted people in the room as safety professionals to offer insight, events that have happened. But the people that should be in a room looking at risk appetite and what you want to do or how you want to do it, or even what your culture needs to be or wants to be, it should be, you know, 80% everyone, 20% safe professional. Yeah. For no other reason other than we see risk every day and therefore we are. And and we've we've bills to pay. So I didn't mean like just cut us out completely. Yeah. We still want to be there. <laughs> into it <laughs> yeah well there was there's a book i was given a snippet of a book by an amazing guy um where i work now and they were talking about uh the language of risk and they're also talking about um changing perceptions of risk and saying as safety professionals because we have seen really horrible accidents we had to deal with them and because of what we do everywhere we go we'll see more than anybody we will naturally say something as high risk than it is um mm. Because our anchor, our reference, our frame of reference is just like polluted with multiple events. Rather, well, it definitely happens. is. Yeah. it's like, do you know that um that film from like late nineties, early nineties, but Final Destination? Yes, it's like you're walking around, you're like, oh Jesus, everything is a fucking death trap, lads. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, have those critical conversations, definitely. And I think one of your original questions at the beginning of this, Elisa, was. Who is writing the curriculum? And I think maybe the question is, how can we get involved? I do know that I was asked a couple of times by um, Nibosh to get involved looking at their curriculum. So I think in mm-hmm. some cases, they'll reach out to professionals to say, is this indicative of a workplace or indicative of how you would really run it? Which I think is a really good thing. And I really hope everybody does that. But yeah. if you're listening to this and you work for an organisation that pumps out training courses or curriculum of any, any sort and you haven't got professionals that work with those risks every day involved please please reach out linkedin is a great place get people involved and make sure that content is up to date and you know is relevant to them yeah. so Ooh. amazing well i mean i think uh, considering you didn't know what you wanted to talk about when you first came on and it was just curriculums i think we uh curriculums think- and fly swatting you tune in here for the good shit guys <laughs> uh, well as always for everyone that has listened or has watched we maintain that we will leave this podcast and this um video podcast unedited because we really believe in representing just like what it really looks like to do a podcast i want to regret this someday i just like yeah when I, when when emily is uh, 18 being mum, what state are you in um uh, <laughs> oh god um but yeah we really want this to be real but uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope you got some nuggets in there to take away, some books to go and read, some people to look up. Um, and the next episode of Speak is going to be on New View. And we're kind of going to be digging right into it. Um, we even played with, do we call it Screw New View? Let's put it that way. <laughs> so really- I, nearly had a, I nearly had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> so please please join us um for the new view chat um on our next episode take See care ya. bye